Woo! Thank you, choir. Amazing. Thank you, Jesus. He is risen. Come on now. Come on now. This changes everything. This changes the whole course of history. He's risen. risen. Come on. Let's go. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. My absolute favorite passage on the resurrection of Jesus. Let me now remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached. You welcomed it then and you still stand firm in it. It is this good news that if you continue to believe the message I told you, you will recognize this truth. I passed on to you what was most important and what had been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins just as the scriptures said. He was buried and then he was raised from the dead on the third day just as scriptures said. Thank you. He was seen by Peter, then by the 12. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers um, um, at the one time, and of most of whom are, are still even alive. If Christ has not been raised, then our faith is useless, and you are still guilty of your sins. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. So you see, just as death came into the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another. Just as everyone dies, we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to life, or belongs to Christ, I got ahead of myself, will be given new life. Let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die, but we will all be transformed. It will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever. And we who are living will be also be transformed. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. Then when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? For the sting, sorry, for the sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power, but thank God, he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. That's a heavyweight passage. Heavyweight passage. Victory is promised. We can go so far as to say victorious because it's been accomplished in the fact that Jesus is alive. I love, like Pastor Ash had said, I love Easter Sunday. And the older I get, the more I find myself just loving the fact that we come together to celebrate this day. It recenters me. It gives me hope in a world that seems to be falling apart around me. It reminds me that sin, my sin, your sin, our sin is forgiven. It, it reminds me that death is defeated. It affirms the fact, the historical truth, that Jesus is alive. God is alive. The king, he reigns and he reigns victoriously. Those of you who know me best know that my natural disposition is generally one that's pretty positive particularly positive that if something needs to get done, I'm going to get it done. Positive that if I need to push through, I can push through. And that if necessary and there's a hill that needs to be taken, I'm going to take that hill. But if I'm being honest with you, 
in this season and the reality of the state of our world, I find myself and my soul more discouraged than normal. I find myself more pessimistic uh, when it comes to reflecting on even me and my efforts. And if I'm being honest, others, even though I know I'm not supposed to throw the stones, that ain't my job. But it finds itself in this place because we live in this state, this season, if you will, where we have this post-pandemic, where our world is at war with each other, symbolically but most definitely, literally and physically as well. Finances are going crazy as inflation just hits and sets in. And in the midst of it, political leaders who, some of whom I just don't, frankly, I just don't trust them to navigate it. I'll still pray for them. Don't get me wrong. I will still pray for them. I just don't trust them. In a a world, in a country where there's this, you know, continual... uh, evolution or advancement to our national MAID program, in, in a world, in, 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 a, in a, a culture that indoctrinates my kids into a system that I know is going to lead to greater shackles in future generations and in my grandkids one day, in a, in a world where this self-inflicted endemic with social media is linked directly to the rise of self-harm and anxiety in our kids. My soul finds itself discouraged, and then I have to try and be a leader, a servant in the midst of it. Thank goodness for Easter Sunday. That's just my list. I bet you you could add a few. Easter Sunday, it re-centers me. It gives me hope one more time in a fresh way. I'm reminded that sin is forgiven, death defeated, Jesus alive, that the king reigns, and that as the scriptures speak of him, he rules, both now and to come. And the scriptures paint this beautiful picture as he rules. He rules as a lion. And I want to consider that image. We talked last week about the glory of the lamb. And it was because of the suffering of the lamb that the lion rules today. And and we find this picture being painted of the rule of the lion in Revelation chapter 5. And if you were to continue on what you did last week, 6 and beyond, you see it's because of the suffering of the lamb. But let's settle in on 5, 1 to 5 in the book of Revelation really quickly. It says this, Then I saw a scroll in the right hand of the one who was sitting on the throne. There was writing on the inside and the outside of the scroll, and it was sealed with seven seals. We have a picture here of the Father in heaven holding this scroll, ready to pass it off. It's a a deed, if you will, a a will that uh, declares that which is happening and is to come for the setting up of a kingdom. And as he sits there with this, we get to verse 2. And I saw, this is the Apostle John with this vision. I saw a strong angel who shouted with a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals on the scroll and open it? But no one in heaven and on earth was able to open the scroll and read it. This fascinates me, a little side note. The strong angel identified this. Now, I don't have time to get into this, but I don't think there's weak angels. But perhaps there are, or at least there appears to be those who are stronger than others. This is significant, but we don't have our time to unpack that. And notice it's the strong one. No one can open this. Not even the strong angel can open this scroll. John, the one who's in the midst of this vision, Verse four, I began to weep bitterly 
because no one was found worthy to open the scroll and read it. There's this anguish around it. Like he, he longs to know what this, this scroll, this title deed, this will of that which is to come from the Father says. But one of the 24 elders says this to me. Another side note, we don't know who the 24 elders are. There are some uh, hypotheses around this and what have you. I'm just really curious who the one was. I hope one day I get to ask that question in heaven. Who was the one? I'm really curious. The one that identified this. Stop weeping. Look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the heir to David's throne, has one the victory. He is worthy to open the scroll. Enter the Lion of Judah. This is no coincidence that this language is being used, that this um, um, reference, this symbolism is being used. It's, re- it's a, a reference and a symbol that goes all the way back to almost the origin story of the people, God's people uh, uh, being formed and coming together. You find this actually in Genesis chapter 49. In Genesis 49, you find Jacob, a, uh, a, a grandchild of, of Father Abraham, and, and he's blessing or prophesying over his children. And as he comes to Judah, he prophesies or he speaks this blessing out over him. Judah, your brothers will praise you. You will grasp your enemies by the neck. All your relatives will bow before you. Let's hit pause for a moment. Now, I got a good brother. He's a good man. Some of y'all know that I'm a little sportsy, and some of you I'm maybe a little too sportsy for you than for others, and, and what have you. Go Oilers, go, man. We're on a tear. Um, anyway, side note, total side note. Uh, um, my brother, if you think I'm sportsy, my brother is the sportsy one, all right? I, I pale in comparison to him. And, and for the first 35 years of my brother's life, he was a single for significantly longer than I. All his dispensable income, and he had a lot because he had no family, went towards sportsy things. He traveled the world doing this kind of stuff. He's this big old burly guy. Uh, He looks a lot like me. People say we look like twins. I don't get it. He's got blonde hair. I got brown. I got hazel eyes. He's got blue. But whatever. And and, 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 and he's done all these these sports things anyways. Um, His life got altered a few years ago. In in our family unit, uh, my family had boys. My sister's family had boys. We had no girls. We were missing out. My brother then, he, a couple years ago, married a girl who had two girls, so we had to marry in the, the nieces and the granddaughters. And my sportsy brother, he now has sparkle craft days, <laughs> tea parties, and while I'm at the football field, he's at dance recitals. <laughs> he is a good man, a good man. I genuinely look up and to admire, uh, admire him in that my brother, he has this calm disposition that I wish I had. He has a patience and a gentleness about him that I deeply admire. He would say the same thing as what I'm about to say, by the way, but I know the other side. And if you were to say in front of me to my brother, one day you're going to bow, <laughs> no. I ain't bowing. And here we have Jacob, a.k.a. Israel, proclaiming over Judah that your relatives, your brothers, are going to bow. Huh? No, not me. Judah, my son, is a young lion. He has finished eating its prey. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down. Like a lioness, who dares to rouse him? The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from his descendants until the coming of the one who belongs, the one whom all nations will honor. Even before 
the, the setting up of a, a monarchy or a kingdom, if you will. There's this reference now to the scepter and the ruler that would come from Judah. This isn't no ordinary prophetic word or no ordinary blessing. This is foreshadowing something that we celebrate today. That Jesus, born in the line of Judah as the lion of Judah, would come, live a life without sin, and then offer up his life as a sacrifice on the cross that sin could be forgiven, was buried, then rose again, alive, that sin might be forgiven, death defeated, that Jesus is alive, that the king might reign both now and to come. The heir of the line of David, this is 2 Samuel chapter seven. God speaking here, proclaiming over David, furthermore the Lord declares, declares that he will make a house for you, a dynasty of kings. For when you die and are buried with your ancestors, I will raise up one of your descendants, your own offspring, and I will make his kingdom strong. He is the one who will build a house, a temple for my name. I will secure his royal throne forever. The line of Judah. He's come. He's lived a life without sin. He took on our sin. He was buried and he rose from the dead. His rule and his reign has begun and it is to come in all of its fullness just as 1 Corinthians 15 spoke of. And I don't know about you, but for me, this Easter, in this season of life, more than any other Easter, I need the hope of the resurrection. I need the reminder that Jesus is alive. I need that recentering to remember sin is forgiven. That death is defeated. That Jesus is alive. And that the king, my king, reigns. The best part of this, in the words of Tony Evans, on the cross, Jesus did not say, I am finished. He said, it is finished. He was just getting started. The rule of the lion has begun. Jesus reigns and he reigns victoriously. Hail, hail, Lion of Judah. We live in the middle of both the promise and the prophecy, don't we? The rule, it's begun, but it is also something that is to come. And we, as we consider this and think about this, if you were to fast forward in that letter of Revelation, which I know gets a little confusing at times, I will admit that myself, but fast forward to the last four chapters, 19 to 21, 22 as well. And you see, you're reminded of that rule that is to come. If you haven't read that recently, I'd encourage you to read it. Read it this Easter. Oh, the hope, the recentering that it gives and it brings as we anticipate the rule to come. A new heaven, a new earth, where God's home is with his people in the garden city, just like he designed it and planned it at the beginning. Hail, hail, Lion of Judah. And one day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. 
but it is also a promise for now. The rule's begun. And Jesus speaks so very clearly of his rule and his reign. It's a rule and reign that this side of heaven, we get to experience and walk in. It's a a rule and a reign where we can speak to the valleys and tell them to rise up. Jesus speaks of his rule as a rule of peace. Uh, John uh, chapter 14, 27, perhaps says this better than any other word that Jesus spoke in this regards to this part of his rule. He says this, I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. The rule of King Jesus is a rule of peace, so valleys be raised up. Jesus speaks of his reign and his rule in another way. His rule is actually a rule that is intended to bring rest. Thus, we can say to the mountains, be made low. Jesus speaks of this rule in Matthew at chapter 11, verse 28. And then Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens. I will give you rest. Hail, hail, line of Judah. Valleys be raised up, mountains be made Why can I say this? How can I say this? The reason why is simple. Easter Sunday, he's proved it. Jesus, he was seen by Peter, then by the 12. He was seen by at one time more than 500 of his followers, most of whom were alive at the time. You know what's really fascinating about the early church? Is that their opponents didn't oppose them with the thought or the, uh, um, the evidence that Jesus is still dead. No, that was never the way they put They posed it for all kinds of other different things. That they wouldn't bow to Caesar. Or, you know, that on the day of Pentecost that they were drunk rather than filled with the Holy Spirit, which is what they were. They, they came with all kinds of, but they never came at the fact that Jesus hadn't risen. Because historically, it's true. The evidence is overwhelming. Jesus is alive. So I can say, in the midst of the promise and the prophecy, the rule of the line has begun. Because he's alive. How can I say this? It's been my experience. I'm not going to lie and tell things that aren't true. I was honest earlier. I told you this has been a heavy season, a hard season for me. I'm sure for many others. But my experience is this. At no other season of my life have I in greater ways experienced walking with Jesus. The moments where I actually take time to slow down and sit in his presence, I experience the resurrected Lord and Savior of all. I meet with him. I talk with him because he's alive. And he longs for this for all of us. A rule where we experience peace and rest now. And Jesus, he invites you to come and to experience his rest. The question is, will you?